after that round of intros, I wish that I had made this like more philosophical, but uh, this uh, uh, slot, or at least the, the description in the schedule, is mainly about um, uh, you know some of the people that are building platforms to do apps on IPFS and seeing how we can you know do cross pollination and uh, where we can help each other. So this is essentially a mainly a technical overview um, at uh, roughly breakneck pace uh, to see where there might be uh, points of overlap. But again, please do ask questions along the way. And if we go totally off from these slides, it's fine by me. So uh, the web native SDK. Um, which is uh, the name for, or the umbrella term for a bunch of stuff that we're building over at Fission, uh, which is a portable edge stack, or uh, just an encrypted at rest file system location independent user controlled data self modifying apps and service auth protocol in a trench coat. Uh, I'm Brooklyn Zelenka, uh, I'm the CTO at Fission. And uh, where we started with all of this stuff was uh, looking at you know, a lot of people in the Web3 space were struggling to build. Um, sort of classic Web 2 apps, and we were looking at you know a, a lot of the tech and said, well, this should actually make things easier, right? As much as we care about decentralization and security, that's a little bit like um, uh, you know e eating your vegetables, right? Like it's something you should do, but like you know people say they like security, but they don't they don't behave like they do, right? Like lots of people use Facebook, you know, literally billions of people use Facebook on a daily basis. So how can we make things? Um, not just better from a security and decentralization point of view, but like what's the, um, how can we make people's lives better on like a literally a day to day basis, right? So the original idea was this is, you know, sort of your typical Web2 stack today, has all these parts in the middle, and that's a lot for people to have to uh, train, hire for. Um, maintain all this up in the stack. You know, suddenly now you have to do all this DevOps stuff these days. In addition to just trying to get an app to your users, right? Um, and by using some of these newer techniques and uh, newer technologies, I think we can shrink this down um, and make it so that it's building an app on the web or on a desktop is essentially the same, right? We can make everything feel like um, like an iOS or Android app everywhere. Um, and then the, the actual benefit this would then bring to people is that they have much faster iteration. You don't have to train them in all of these. You know, you don't have to become a full stack dev plus DevOps plus all these other things. Um, you focus on the users. You can respond to their feedback much faster, and you have a lower barrier to entry. Right. So if we think software is going to eat the world, we need to train a lot more people a lot faster. Right? Um, high level dependencies. We uh, have always wanted to get to compute. Um, but to do compute, you need to do data. And to do data in production, you need some sort of auth system so that people can't uh, look at all of, your, uh, all of your files. So we ended up building it in roughly this order, auth, then data, then compute. Um, this is the stack that ended up resulting from that. Uh, we're not all the way through this yet. Uh, we're about roughly here, uh, working from the bottom up. Um, so, and we'll, we'll touch on a bunch of these throughout this presentation. So uh, using DIDs um, for identity, uh, CryptTree, um, modified CryptTree, you can networking, you have this durable file store, which I talked a bunch about yesterday. So I'm going to skip uh, like mostly over that, but that's uh, the web native file system. Uh, we have offline and async sharing, and we're now starting on a uh, scalable, fully distributed uh, database. Uh, local first uh, on top of IPFS uh, as well. Um, and we will eventually get to that portable compute section uh, near the top there. And then there's this nice line and then abstractions uh, to get that into developers' hands so that they don't need to know that there's this towering stack of things uh, underneath. In terms of actual experience, um, the end goal right, is to make it so that people don't have to know that there's something uh, special happening. So sorry, I didn't create a new demo. This is from a previous presentation, um, where it just looks like a regular app, but the data underneath is owned by the user and portable between apps. So here's that file from the previous app, and we can now load it up in this sort of file explorer view, uh, or have um, data. You know, the user gets to see essentially almost like an OAuth login, right? Um, and uh, load some music into a uh, music app, right? So this, this, this kind of thing. So starting with that bottom of that, that uh, three-layer stack, um, 
authorization and authentication. Uh, because we decided to start with the web, uh, that meant that we're working in browsers, and browsers are uh, extremely hostile environments. Um, and doing key management here is hard, right? Um, and in terms of threat model, uh, the biggest problem that you can have is uh, somebody runs off with your keys, right? So it doesn't matter how secure your key is. If somebody has it, they, you know, they've installed a malicious extension into your browser, or their app is going to go around you know, uh, uh, collecting your keys, you're, you're essentially hooped. So um, if we have this uh, malicious user, uh, they're trying to get to that key. But with the Web Crypto API, uh, we have uh, non-extractable keys. So that sits behind this barrier. And you can then pass to things uh, to sign, but they never actually get direct access to this key. So we put a line in the sand right at the beginning. For anything that needs signatures, it has to not have exportable keys. For uh, encrypted data, we don't really have a choice, right? You need to hand a key around to somebody else so that they can decrypt it. But for uh, signatures, uh, everything's done this way. Now, when you're not moving keys around, uh, but you still need identity, there's two ways of doing this. Um, one is with DIDs, and then you're going to register all of these keys to a single identity. And then the other is uh, with capabilities. So. Um, DIDs broadly, it's a, a standard from the W3C um, and uh, actually has tons of adoption. Uh, so Microsoft, a bunch of governments are using it. Um, and it's also based on public key crypto. Um, and you end up with a document that essentially says, here's the identifier and all of the keys that are associated with it currently. Um, we technically use these, but only DID key. It's just a wrapper around just a single key. And uh, using UCAN, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, we transfer not the identity around. In fact, we don't really care so much about who the user is. We transfer the authority around only. Now, the other advantage of that is uh, you can register the same user into multiple apps. Uh, and uh, you know, let's say Boris has an app, and he wants to share some capabilities with me. We don't have to create some sort of shared user to do that. We can just pass around the little bits of things. Uh, to each other. So it ends up being very, very flexible. And you can do things like progressive accounts. So somebody can show up, not sign up at all, start using the app immediately. And if they later want to register a username, that's a thing that they can do. But they don't have to. They don't have to register anything with anybody by default. There's often reasons that you want to for discovery, but you don't have to. Um, we're also increasingly finding that, uh, so we have some data and uh, placing some of this information about who the original creator was or the key that created it directly in that data structure and a well-known uh, as a pattern is uh, extremely useful so that we can then have some data structure that is owned by or at least has some, you know, it's like signing your name on the bottom of your shoe sort of thing, right? It's like this is owned by so-and-so, right, by this key at, at, the, at the root. Um, so you can. This is how we move uh, capabilities around. And we like to say that if uh, DIDs say who you are, who you know fundamentally is about asymmetric crypto, so you know they can sign with this thing. Therefore, they're uh, and nobody else has that key. Therefore, they're who they, they claim to be. But you can show what you can do. Okay, so this is divided really neatly into uh, authorization and authentication. Uh, they look pretty familiar. In fact, we designed them to to be familiar to Web two devs. So they're JWTs. Uh, with some special fields in them. And they have these two with, which is a resource. It's just literally a URI. Any URI can go in there. And uh, can, what they can do with this thing. And that's some, some action. And then uh, potentially some extensible fields as well. So if you want to put, say, a regex in there, uh, you can do that. And then it uh, works on this chained model. So. We have these different users, or they don't even have to be different people. These could just be different devices, uh, or even different processes on the same machine. Doesn't really matter. Uh, so you have the original creator, in this case, the little artist in the, the cloud, has some ambient authority because they've signed their name into the data structure. Right? Um, they'll delegate by saying, well, only these things, only these capabilities, only these actions, I'm going to delegate to the astronaut here. And then that astronaut can go further and delegate more and more, as long as these are getting narrower as we go along. They can only do the same or less uh, as, as we move through. 
Uh, and so it forms this chain that's uh, cryptographically verifiable as, as we walk back. So if you get this last invoked one where you know, the person actually goes to use this, um, then we just check um, all of the proofs. Uh, walking back in this chain and we can prove that, yep, uh, the, the owner, the person who signed into this data structure um, was the original creator of it. Um, those proofs uh, are just embedded in the regular JWT like this. Um, they're serialized um, and then signed. So we need that serialization um, ahead of time so that the signature is verifiable because in a JWT, you serialize it first and then you sign it. So these have to be serialized to uh, base64 URL and embedded inside. Uh, and in the latest version of the spec uh, that we are hopefully going to merge <laughs> uh, uh, this week, um, these have turned into CIDs. So they've been extracted out now, and you can put it in a car file, for example. Um, and then the signature has to match whoever issued the credential. And then as you're unwrapping these and you're walking back through and, and checking that uh, these are all valid, um, you do the same uh, process to each proof, which may uh, recursively have more proofs inside of it. The upshot of this um, is we're using the same, essentially the same tech as, uh, as OAuth underneath, uh, where this is the OAuth sequence, or a fairly typical one. It's about, I haven't counted this in a while, but you know, 12 or 13 steps to just access some resource on a resource server, and requires you know, four actors in, the, in here. Um, and uh, we can actually, so this is uh, actually being generous to OAuth, this is uh, a UCAN flow. So this could actually just be a single line, but let's say that we're doing it in like a classic application style. Uh, it would look more like this. Um, we, and it also, um, because it uses cryptographic proofs instead of looking up things in a database or some shared secrets, uh, this all works uh, offline as well. So you're not always going out to some server and incurring uh, that latency cost. So file system, uh, if you were around yesterday, uh, you saw a bit more of this. Uh, user controlled data means that the data is controlled by the user, not by the app. Uh, and so you know, we have Alice, Bob, and Carol. Uh, Bob has a photo gallery, but we can also share data across multiple users that are using the same app, so, uh, or, or potentially different apps, right? So Carol's video game is gonna be spread across Bob and Carol's stuff, and we can load them both in at the same time. Um, Alice's music player, maybe it even has some overlap with the video game and everybody's stuff in this, in this picture. So it makes data portability really easy. There's no more export function. And because of how, um, you know, as I was saying before, uh, we don't really care about who is doing the action, like literally which human, just the signing keys. Um, these could also be the same person, just different devices. And so we've made it very easy for these things to then also merge together later. So if you create you know, two different, in giant scare quotes, users on two different apps, or even on the same app, you can later come back and merge those back together. We'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Uh, by default, uh, everything is immutable, uh, so we never delete anything. Um, you can go through and delete stuff, um, but it's more manual. So. Uh, just like how uh, if anybody's on uh, a Mac or, or has been on a Mac for a while, rather, um, Time Machine, where you can, if you delete a file, you can always get back to it or see a previous version of the file. We've implemented almost exactly Time Machine. Um, they do that with Unix uh, hard links. We do this with uh, CIDs, essentially hard links. Um, and uh, using all the nice uh, structural sharing properties that we get from, uh, from IPLD to do that. So this is the same directory adding one file we only need to add, what is this, four links, three files, and we get full versioning uh, underneath. Uh, and then we've also made it uh, evented so that uh, from the root, you can see uh, you know, this kind of event happened below, and then uh, there's this um, insert new, and then which specific file was inserted. So it's actually, it's more than a graph, it's a, technically a hypergraph, um, because we have these uh, events on there as well. Um, because we're building things for apps, uh, we need to have multiple writers at once and uh, to do concurrent writes. So uh, these um, Merkle CRDTs uh, were originally developed at Protocol Labs and has been uh, extended by uh, Martin Kleppman and, and uh, a bunch of others. Um, and essentially we can take um, a file system uh, over time 
and use a reconciliation mechanism to um, essentially do like a, a git merge automatically without having to um, uh, ask the user to do this for you um, by picking one of them um, automatically and then uh, if we picked the wrong one uh, based on heuristic, you can always go back and say, well, actually, I wanted the other one and bring that forward. Um, big advantage of this is if you have these two completely separate file systems, uh, it's the same. You can just merge any two arbitrary data structures now. So if I have two users, I can stitch them together. Or if I have one user who's diverged because they were you know, offline or, or uh, uh, had two devices that were doing updates at the same time and there was latency or any of these cases, we can stitch them together. It doesn't matter. Um, the system doesn't care which scenario, scenario you're in. It knows how to do this reconciliation. Um, and because it's multi-user, uh, we need a way of sharing things when they're not online. It's pretty simple. We uh, create a um, deterministic naming system, encrypt things, uh, do a key exchange, um, offline key exchange, uh, and then um, let that uh, as an entry point into some encrypted data. Um, they can decrypt it with their asymmetric key uh, and then uh, unwrap um, whatever data you're sending to them. The downside of this today is you have to know that there's some data over there that you want to look at. Uh, and where we're going, and I'm going to touch really briefly at the end on uh, this uh, distributed database, is uh, that ends up as a, behaving as a message queue. And so you can uh, gossip, hey, there's going to be a message over there for you. You should go look at it. Uh, but that doesn't exist today. Today you have to actually know to go open up the specific app, and then it'll do the automatic check for you. Um, talked about this yesterday as well. Um, Obviously, there's a uh, hierarchical encryption. So if I only give you access to my photos directory, you only get access to that. You can't see my documents. You can't see the root of the, the file system. And this is all done just with um, symmetric encryption, each of those keys. Whichever one I give to you, you can see everything below, because that will give you the key to the lower directory, which has the keys for all of its files. So if I give you only one file at a single version, because we're versioned, right? Um, you'll only see that one, or I can give you a directory at a certain version, you'll only see that one, or we can say this directory for all time. And you can then see reading forward. Uh, and that's the, the time one there. Um, actually, we don't really need to talk about the skip ratchet. <laughs> um, and that's it, rediscovering that uh, structure. We are rewriting it in Rust, um, as the, the kids say, uh, for portability uh, and WebAssembly. Uh, so that this can then run everywhere. So we, the last couple of years, have focused mainly on the web, um, but we want this to run uh, on desktops, on phones, on everything. Um, and we've also found massive speed ups for a lot of cryptography, uh, switching from JavaScript to Rust uh, and, and, and WebAssembly, um, like 100x improvement in some cases. Uh, so uh, would, would recommend. And then I said I'll just really briefly touch on, we have this uh, distributed database coming. Um, it, is essentially based on property graphs plus encryption. Um, and we take the same basic idea as the file system where we blow away these links, put it in a flat structure. It's actually a set now instead of a, a tree. It, the order does not matter. Um, and uh, we get a bunch of really nice properties like we can reorder uh, all of the rows. You can pull only certain rows if you, if you need them. We have explicit dependencies uh, on uh, time and ordering. Uh, that only appear if you care about those things. So you can write a query that isn't against time. Um, and uh, different devices can hold on to different, literally down to the single row level. You can just grab uh, exactly what you need. So if you're on a low power device, um, uh, it'll still work. Uh, and then this is going to get us uh, all of that nice broadcast and uh, soft real time stuff that I was talking about before. That's it. Thanks. That was a lot. It's a lot. It's, uh, what's the gross usage? Or not usage, what's the gross usage of what is? So we've had people experiment with a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, so TiddlyWiki uh, uh, has an integration, uh, which is nice. So you can you know, uh, essentially bake down uh, um, HTML files 
uh, and also make use of the file system and uh, all of the data in there, uh, uh, which is nice. So it's, it can hold arbitrary data, including websites, right? So all of that stuff. Um, we've, uh, uh, one of our team members, uh, so a lot of the people we've hired uh, started writing demo apps and we're like, you seem awesome, come join us. Um, uh, built a uh, dynamic Wasm loader uh, as well, uh, which is pretty cool. So actually really excited about the, like, the dynamic programming uh, capabilities. And so, well, not, not DP, but you know, being able to load in stuff um, statefully, really interesting. Um, the main thing that's uh, held us back right, on, on the flip side um, is uh, we put the line in the sand early on saying, if we're uploading over HTTP and we're downloading over HTTP, we've just created a web server with extra steps, right? So let's lean into IPFS, and that has been both amazing and extremely painful, right? Uh, when it works, it's awesome, right? But it doesn't always work. I think that's actually a really good point, and maybe something for everyone who talks to, to highlight. So we run JS IPFS in the browser, uh, and, and also we have a CLI where we add everything locally and then use uh, JS, uh, use IPFS natively to actually pull from the developer desktop. Um, uh, as an example, and we've, uh, this is how we've ended up essentially here, I mean, literally here in this room, of like, oh shit, we need to slightly improve parts of the IPFS protocol. So uh, I think learn from us, JS IPFS in browser is not really viable. Yeah. Fair statement. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and it's both like, browsers themselves, you know, their, their overall security model um, and you know, as, as things are getting more secure, say you know, Firefox is adding more security features, Apple just announced a bunch of security features, that makes it more difficult. The real pain is that they all have slightly different APIs supported, right? So like web workers, just like they work one week and then they stop working in one browser, right? Mm -hmm. With like 20% market share. Like, well, what now? We, we literally yesterday with the team, but kind of late here, uh, I think we're basically gonna say Chrome and Safari because basically Firefox has made it so that just various things don't work. And we're like, Brooks of Firefox primary user. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're like, I don't think we can support it. Plus Brave, but Brave is essentially Chrome. With yeah. But what, one asterisk on that. Uh, so I'm giving a talk tomorrow, the day after, uh, on Carpool. So we're also writing protocols and implementations into Kubo and other places so that it can be like we can use other transports than BitSwap, right? So BitSwap has a bunch of challenges, especially for the web, um, not just the fact that you know the latency of all those round trips. Um, and if you can start pushing car files over uh, HTTP with deduplication, you gain a lot, right? And so a lot of these problems go away. So, sorry. Uh, you said it's not viable in the browser, is it purely because of compatibility or performance for uh, a, a, a bit of both. Uh, so there's, um, yeah, uh, uh, time on the DHT can be pretty bad sometimes. Um, sometimes really good. Um, the, uh, some browsers will just suddenly drop support for some features, right? So not having web worker support um, for JSIPFS can be very painful. Uh, you, you look at content addressing and think, ah, obviously we should be able to share apps on the same system and not go out to the internet and come all the way back. And that's, in a lot of browsers, not possible currently, right? So, um, or you can push around small chunks of data, but they're slowly locking down different parts, right? Or at least Firefox and Safari are. Um, so, or, uh, you know, uh, Apple, what, a year and a half ago, announced that they'll just start randomly uh, clearing local storage and index DB, right? So even if you're lo loading stuff, and it could happen at any time. So uh, not when the user is actively using it, but as soon as they uh, navigate away, they might clear that cache because they don't want you to get tracked, right? So specifically, right now, JSIPFS um, works in demos that you will find on the internet for arbitrary peer to peer use cases. To run it in production, we have to run ourselves a bunch of infrastructure which only links to fission infrastructure by default run um uh secure web uh, yeah yeah uh we, we need a, a tls proxy in front of uh, web sockets because that's not baked into kubo um also js ipfs uh doesn't 
use the main DHT by default. Uh, so you have to talk up to a specific instance. Um, you can network GSIPFS instances in the browser against each other over um, WebRTC, but now you need to run a WebRTC uh, signaling server, uh, which should just get baked in, I think, into uh, all of these nodes so that you could then just point at any of them, but that doesn't exist today. And actually, Matrix has some uh, apparently uh, solution for this like very recently. In the past couple of weeks, they just started on it um, that we could maybe bake into, um, into things. Uh, just what transports for Sorry? Web transports work. Oh, that's great. Because yeah. that's coming to a little which should allow connecting to nodes without SSL certificates. OK. D does that exist? Sorry, when, when's that sh has that already shipped? Uh, uh, Martin is kind of working on it. OK. Uh, the idea is to support browsers so we can finally connect to the like that's not what about. <laughs> um, Amazing. <laughs> a few other things. So I'll, I'll put this in the parking lot. But as an example, I think one of the things is, like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if the default experience would allow you to have some of these things? It just works. Oh, yeah. Hey, who wants to run, jointly run, in WebRTC servers? Like, I'll run one, like, ceramic, pinata, right? Like, exactly. Like, we can get any equal five people running at WebRTC and doing a community bootstrap that way. That might be really And if you're excited about that, you should, co you should come to the uh, Content Address Alliance talk. On Friday? Friday? Yes. My understanding is that you can use third party signaling protocols. So like, mm -hmm. like we, we now have the, the, the ephemeral uh, uh, neurons. And the, the thing was we could use that to do signaling for web RTC. Is that not possible? So, so all of these things are how do you do it in such a way that a front end web developer yes. who has a default experience of now find your cell or whatever where stuff works. But it doesn't have to run in front of themselves. Oh, was, the point here is that like everyone on the network, everyone else on the network is running one of these servers, basically, one of these different relays. So there is no need to do that. So like this is we're currently using this for like for Kubo to make Kubo connect to the nets. But the goal is to eventually make that work for the browsers as well. Uh, but yeah, this is all very recent stuff. So, yeah. so like one thousand percent agree. It's like great, let's do that. And then everybody knows like like in general, a lot of people who come into like. Oh my God! I'm running out of in production. Help, please. Am I doing it wrong? And we're like, no, no. It's just in, you know, yeah, right. And, yeah. and so, can we like take a new initiative like this and be like, sweet, we ship a new thing that totally includes both the X and UX? I think that kind of came up as well again. I'd like to use the trust term. Also, so, uh, so Steve, um, do you mean that Robert is seeing it? it doesn't it doesn't need a signal on the server? You well, can connect your your. Well, there's a it, it needs a signal to our source, but like, like you don't necessarily need to like, use the stun protocol. Like, you don't need a specific protocol. You can use, as far as I understand, any form of signal that you have and tell it, like, here are my addresses. That's my understanding. Which has to make it all the way into our, uh, all of our um, default app template yeah. code examples that are like, fill this out, and this is a default thing that will give you a thing that will just work. Right. Or in your docs, you're like, connect to ours or Whatever. In this case, it should. So, like, the, the idea is that you would just have like, if you connect to a set of bootstrappers. And the bootstrappers would connect to. I get it. Like, literally, that's the thing that either has to be fully baked into the library by default. Yes. So Which that when good. someone includes the NPM thing, yep. it just works. And then we got to then, hey, by the way, pointing is at your Pinata IPFS gateway in this link if you want to also support it. Yep. You know, like, it, it, it's all the way down to. Yeah, if we don't want to have to separately do this, yeah. that we share resources on saying this is the way that we work in every hackathon that we sponsor, yeah. shit just works out of the box. Yeah. That, that would be, like, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, so uh, maybe not about this specific um, transport or, or, or signaling system, but it, like in general, like Kubo to Kubo works like a bazillion times better than anything involving a browser today. I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up moving from, so we were running GSI back then. Uh, we kind of ended up moving away from it. We couldn't get off the top of the mountain. And, yeah. and, and not to blame anyone. Oh, yeah. I, I know um, Alex, <laughs> Alex is working on it a long time. Yeah, but like, like GSFS on the back end, especially, like, it was designed for browsers. But then for some reason, we decided to add support for running in Node, because why not? Um, but it, like, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's memory. It's, uh, yeah, we're just not there. Yeah, we've always just had more resources in the Node that has better performance on this kind of stuff. So. 
Yeah, the, 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 this is a, a pro probably a semi-controversial statement, um, but uh, I would love to see high quality wasmable Rust libraries so that people could construct their own uh, nodes so that it, we're not spending time spreading across all of these different implementations, right? And then we can get it into browsers, into edge services, into all of these places, right? And that's not to say that it has to, has to use all of these pieces, but at least it gets you up and running and we can have really high quality libraries for this stuff. So there, there is lib, um, libipfs, is it now? Um, in Seago, I think, um, which might work. Uh, I haven't played with it yet though. There was a tech to get Go web because of Go into the browser with WebAssembly. I don't know how that one that went. Um, I know someone was using uh, Go with the P in the browser, uh, but it's not working. Um, I will say, to just Ben, off your, your question, uh, and then we should wrap up and, uh, and move on to the next one. Um, essentially, we have this vision of putting together a web native SDK that can just be used and just works for front end developers. Essentially, this has been a um, extended troll of applied research where we first have to invent the protocol. So our biggest adoption is actually been by peers. Um, so you can and our did method has been adopted. So um, uh, uh, Hugo from the um, so energy storage team, they've gone all along you can, Twitter Blue Sky, um, Jack's lock team and the thing named Web5 is also about that you can because everybody needs to centralize off layers for these sorts of things. And then next up, there's a number of people who are very interested in doing private encrypted data um, on IPFS and CloudCoin. Um, so I'm looking at that. We're happy with protocol adoption. That's the core thing you're doing. And as it hardens, it actually becomes usable <laughs> um, for the just works for private. 